I think Lamar Alexander embodies that. As president of the University of Tennessee, as a governor, as the secretary of education, as a senator, In every one of those jobs, it's always been about doing his best. In a chamber filled with people who think they have a monopoly on wisdom, Lamar has never stopped learning. He's always been curious. Up to this day, I'll bet today, he probably got up and asked somebody on his staff or some one of his colleagues to tell him about something that he wants to learn. so he can do his best. The Senate is gonna be diminished by Lamar's absence. It's hard to believe that we could be any more diminished than we are, but we are gonna be diminished by Lamar leaving. Susan and I were lucky enough to be invited to his home, spend a weekend there, and I, so I'm, just, I'm going to say something now that I never said to Lamar Alexander, but he gave us the great privilege of standing in the family cemetery in eastern Tennessee, in the smoky, his beloved Smoky Mountains, where he will forever keep the windmills uh, out. And as I stood there a little awkwardly in the, in the cemetery, uh, because that's not usually part of a tour. All I could think about was how lucky Lamar and Honey were. To know that that would be the place that they would be. And that long after they were remembered by anybody that they would know that they had done their best that they had always done their best. And so what I would say to my colleagues today is that we have an opportunity to, to follow Lamar's example. Take him up on what he said. We're not memorializing Lamar today. He's gonna have a lot more years left to contribute to his state, to his community, and to the country but he won't be in the Senate, and we are in the Senate. We could work in a Senate that works five days a week, Mr. President, or even six days a week, Mr. President. Sign me up for that, Senate. We could work in a Senate that has 25 amendments a bill instead of 25 amendments in a year, as we did last year because there is no other body in America or in this democracy, as Lamar said, that's set up to decide the hardest questions that our country is facing and to make those decisions for us today. He's left us with a challenge and I hope we'll take him up on it. Because there, there is no excuse for the way this place works. And the American people are tired of hearing that it's the other side's fault. There are 100 people that can fix this place, and I hope we will. I can't think of a greater legacy for Lamar to leave than a Senate that's actually working. That's what the country deserves. And that's the inspiration that Lamar Alexander has set for me. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Mr. President, we all know uh, Lamar Alexander is a person of tremendous character and judgment. And it's not just because he asked that young woman in the red shorts that he met at that softball game so many years ago to marry him, who happens to be from Victoria, Texas. That demonstrates his enormous good judgment. And certainly we wish him and, and Honey the best in this next chapter of their lives. 
But when I think about Lamar Alexander, I think about all the Lamar isms. All this, we've heard some of them here today, um, but uh, find the good and praise it, quotes his friend Alex Haley, which I think speaks to a kind of optimistic, positive view of life that we could use more of. And then I remember the words he, uh, he said, if you want to get a standing ovation before any group of individuals, you need to say, it's time to put the teaching of American history and civics back into its rightful place in our schools so our children can grow up learning what it means to be an American. Well, he talked about the Alex Haley, his friend uh, told him how to give a speech by telling a story. Uh, Aristotle had an idea about how to give a great speech. He basically broke it down to three components. One is the logical argument. The other is the emotional argument. But the other is about establishing your authority, but it's about the character of the speaker. And when I think about Lamar, as he's demonstrated again here today, the thing that I appreciate about him the most is not just what he's accomplished here, but his incredible character and positive impact on our, on our Senate and on our country. And it's been because people know that his heart is in the right place. He's doing it for all the right reasons that we admire him so much. I would just point out, as I've told Lamar previously, I, I was an admirer of Lamar Alexander long before I ever met him. When I voted for him in the Republican primary in 1996 for president, unfortunately, he dropped out of that race shortly thereafter. So I told him I wasted my vote, obviously. But I have been an admirer for a long time. Well, Lamar and I also share something else in common. Um, it's not about his, pre well, it is about his predecessor as well as mine. It's a person by the name of Sam Houston. I occupied the Senate seat first held by Sam Houston when Texas became a state. Of course, he came originally from Tennessee. He happened to be a governor of Tennessee before he left and came to Texas. Later was became governor of Texas and seceded and basically stepped down because he was a union man recruited by Andrew Jackson, he wanted, he, he loved the union. He did not agree with secession. But of course he came to Texas and became the victorious general at the decisive battle of San Jacinto. He became president of the Republic of Texas. The same reason, the reason why the Texas flag and the American flag fly at the same height is because we were an independent nation before we came, became part of the United States. Well, I've heard it said that you could never write a novel based on the life of Sam Houston because nobody would believe it. I've read plenty about him and I still find that to be true. But as I indicated, as proud as Texans are of Sam Houston's contribution to our history and our state, we know we can't claim him entirely because he grew up in Maryville, Tennessee, the same town that Lamar Alexander did, and went on to become governor, as I mentioned a moment ago. Sam Houston's portrait hangs above my desk here in the Hart office building because it helps me remind, it helps remind me of my responsibilities and of the incredible history and contribution that he made and that hopefully each of us can make. Well, you find Sam Houston's picture above my desk, but you find his walking stick in Lamar Alexander's office just down the hall. The many Tennesseans who visited Lamar during his time in the chamber have seen the words Sam Houston, Texas, and Lone Star engraved on its gold cap. And according to Lamar, several Texans have tried to run off with it. Unfortunately, that hasn't been successful. The truth of the matter is you can't get through a Texas history class, or at least you shouldn't, without hearing the role of the volunteer state in the history 
of my state. I always kid Lamar said the Tennesseans that came to Texas that fought at the Alamo in the Battle of San Jacinto, they were just one step ahead of a, a creditor or an aggrieved spouse. Uh, it was a rough and tumble group that came from Tennessee to found Texas. Well, there are other Tennesseans, people like David Crockett, uh, others who came to Texas and created our state. The state of Texas has many reasons to be grateful to the contributions of the sons and daughters of Tennessee, and one of those great sons is Lamar. His dedicated life in public service, as we know, has led him through an incredible uh, number of important offices. But I think the thing that, to me, even more than his legislative accomplishments that's made Lamar so effective is because we know we can trust him. We know his character. We know when he says something, it's true. And we've seen it time and time again when Lamar has used that character and that trust to pass historic legislation in this, in this chamber. And as we've all come to know, when you're working side by side with Lamar on legislation, you're bound to get things done because he's cracked a code. He knows how to do it. I've been proud to work with Lamar on legislation to address the opioid epidemic, support our service members and veterans, protect health coverage, and ensure folks across the country have the opportunity to take advantage of the American dream. His presence has been a constant, has been constant throughout our time. We came to the Senate at the same time. And of course, his retirement makes that all bittersweet. So I want to thank our colleague from Tennessee for his friendship over many years, for the example, as we heard from Senator Thune and others, his example that he has shown for the rest of us how to be an effective member of the United States Senate, and also to thank him for his decades of service to the country. So I don't expect Lamar to follow in the footsteps of Sam Houston and run for governor of Texas, but I know he has many more contributions to make to our great country. And I want to wish him and Honey all the best during this next chapter of their lives. And to make sure that, and I'm, and I'm sure he's looking forward to spending a little more time in their beloved Smoky Mountains. Mark. Mr. President. The Senator from Washington. Mr. President, thank you. I've learned in my time in the Senate that if you want to get something done across the aisle, you really need the following. You need someone on the other side who's just as committed to working together as you are, and that that member needs to have the trust of members on your side of the aisle and on their own. And you both need to be willing to set aside egos and listen and get a realistic understanding of whether the person on the other side of the negotiating table can reach an agreement with you that upholds your principles without compromising their own. And now what I've laid out might not sound that unusual or rare. It's actually pretty tough to find these days. So I've been very lucky that the senator that we are honoring today here on the floor, my colleague and friend, Chairman Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, is someone who has managed it time and time and time again. I don't think anyone, least of all Senator Alexander himself, would be surprised to hear me say that we are as likely to disagree as agree on many matters. I bring my Washington State values to the table. He brings his Tennessee values. So you can imagine how that has gone from time to time. But despite our different perspectives and our different approaches, we take to policymaking. We've also been able to see where our values and the interests of our state and our country converge. We both understood the broken No Child Left Behind law needed to be fixed. And Lamar listened to me, which I so appreciated when I told him we should write a bill together rather than amending the Republican bill that he'd begun working on. With our help committee members, we were able to write and pass a new K-12 public education bill that fixed the most broken parts of No Child Left Behind included federal guardrails so we could understand how all of our students perform, dedicated resources to improving our schools that need it the most, 
and allowed for historic steps forward on early education. We laid the groundwork together for new investments in life-saving biomedical innovation and research through the 21st Century Cures Act, including the Bo Biden Cancer Moonshot. We worked together to pass landmark legislation to boost our response to the opioid epidemic and to strengthen our public health preparedness programs and to permanently fund historically black colleges and universities and minor minority serving institutions. We not only passed each of these bills, but did so time and again with huge majorities from this Senate. And even still now, Chairman Alexander and I, along with our colleagues in the House, are working to get legislation to finally ban surprise medical bills across the finish line. Now, what I've just laid out is by no means a full list at all of Senator Alexander's accomplishments as chairman. It doesn't even include quite a few things he's still trying to get done as we speak right now. Senator Alexander's focus on working together has helped countless families, countless families, in his home state of Tennessee, in my home state of Washington, and nationwide. My Democratic colleagues and I want to thank Chairman Alexander for the tone and manner by which he has led the HELP Committee over the past six years. Some of them, admittedly, rockier than others, but throughout, guided by his steady leadership and commitment to working together. And for myself, as someone who shares the drive to not only fight for what you believe in, but also to look for common ground, I want to thank my colleague from Tennessee for the many opportunities to dig in and get to work that he's provided. For being willing to hear me and my colleagues out again and again and again when necessary. And for looking so often for common ground for another problem we could solve and for being willing not just to keep talking, but to keep listening as well. And finally, I know, Mr. President, that none of this would be possible without the support and strength Senator Alexander has received from his wife, Honey. And I wanna acknowledge and thank her for her contribution as well. Lamar, you'll be thrilled to be back full-time in the state you love so much, I know that. But I and members of the HELP Committee want you to know we are going to miss you terribly here in the Senate. Thank you so much for all you have done. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Mississippi. I ask unanimous consent that Senators Cantwell, Blunt, Romney, Schumer, and I be able to complete our remarks before the next vote. Is there objection? Without objection. I, I thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I don't want to prolong this discussion uh, except to make one additional point about the unselfishness and humility of, of this uh, hero of the Senate, whose remarks we will long uh, remember today. There is a framed piece of legislation hanging on the wall in my conference room in the Dirksen building. It is, in fact, a piece of legislation that Senator Alexander uh, chose to mention as one of his signature accomplishments, and that is the American Civics and History Education Act, signed into law by President George W. Bush. Uh, there's a story about how I came to have that piece of legislation that Senator Alexander worked so hard on um, in, in my conference room on my wall. I was, um, I'm, I live in North Mississippi, and as such, I listen to Memphis television a lot. And during Lamar Alexander's first race for senator, on came a commercial, and basically it said uh, just what our friend from Texas just quoted, that uh, this candidate for senator, former Governor Lamar Alexander, wanted to pass an American Civic Education Bill to teach our children what it means to be an American. And I stopped at that moment and I pointed to that television screen and I said, if that man gets elected, I want to be part of that bill because that's exactly what we need. And so uh, Senator Alexander introduced the bill here in the Senate. I introduced it in the House of Representatives. We made public appearances together, one in Memphis, Tennessee, that I'll always remember. And eventually the bill uh, gained a lot of support over here. Um, and Senator Kennedy has been mentioned as uh, 
as someone at the forefront of that effort. We were able to pass it in the House. It went to conference to, to iron out the details, and a decision had to be made as to which one would actually be enacted by both houses and go to the president for his signature. And Lamar Alexander allowed the piece of legislation introduced by a relatively junior member of the House named Roger Wicker to be that piece of legislation that went on to the White House, to the Oval Office, to be signed by the President of the United States. And uh, so that is how that uh, piece of legislation hangs um, on my wall as a bill authored by Representative Roger Wicker, but uh, passed very much with the efforts of Senator Alexander also. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that, not to prolong this discussion, but mention that act of selflessness and humility as another attribute to this great senator who we say farewell to today. Uh, I think, Mr. President, that the remarks we heard from Senator Alexander will be taught at um, civics classes, college level um, government classes for decades and decades to come. It was so profound and it's a, it is a real honor that a piece of legislation that he and I worked on together will always be a part of what I consider to be those immortal remarks. And so I thank you very much and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I come to the floor too to thank the Senator from Tennessee for his service to our nation and for his work here in the United States Senate. Some of my colleagues have already mentioned that the brevity of words at which Senator Alexander can deliver a message. I, I too remember his comments at uh, as a rules committee member, the inaugural address, really capturing the moment of why a transition of power is so important to our nation. And it struck me that we really had a poet or a writer among us, someone who could sense and feel the moment of what we were going through and express it into words. So I have no doubt that some writing is in Lamar's future here, and I look forward to seeing that. But I wanted to rise today to thank him for his service and what it has meant to my state and to our nation. My colleague from Washington talked about their work together on the HELP Committee. I too want to thank you for the CARES Act. And I remember your recognition on Fox News about stem cell research and the great work that that has led to. So we are appreciative of those research dollars. But I want to focus on a role that maybe has not gotten as much attention, the historic role you've played on our energy budget and our national laboratory budget. I so appreciate the background of your state and the background and focus, but energy funding, both from the national laboratory perspective, has had to have a constant flow and constantly it's been challenged, yet it has put every step forward because of the level of investment in helping us make our nation more secure, create more innovation and create more jobs. So thank you for holding steadfast on the uh, national laboratory budget. I also wanna thank you for your work on the Manhattan Historical Park that we worked together on that both commemorated the history of our nation and our Manhattan project at both Oak Ridge and at Richland, Washington at Hanford. And to just thank you for the constant focus on the cleanup budget that we have had to have in the energy department as it related to Hanford. You know, there was a time when we had many cleanup projects around the nation and it was very easy to come together and say, we had to get Savannah River, we had to get Oak Ridge, we had to get Colorado, we had to get Idaho, and we had to get Hanford. But as those progress, projects made progress, a lot of people forgot about what it took to clean up Hanford. And so I so appreciate your constant focus on helping us get the dollars necessary for cleanup at Hanford. And I also appreciate recently your help on making sure that people didn't overstep on the National Nuclear Security Agency and turn that over to a defense oversight of uh, people, but kept it within the Department of Energy. I so appreciate that. But I will be forever grateful for your focus on public lands. You know, we have a saying in my state, environmentalists make great ancestors. So don't know if you want that environmentalist term associated with your name, but I'm pretty sure you do want stewardship. And the man from the Great Smoky Mountains helped us deliver 
a monumental piece of legislation by convincing the President of the United States to support the budgetary impact of combining both the National Park uh, enhancement program, which is basically taking care of the National Park's backlog, which was in the billions of dollars, and also fully funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund, a battle that had been going on for more than a decade. So I want to thank you for that, Lamar. I want to thank you on behalf of the Washingtonians who will go to so many special places, who will get to visit and commune with their families, who will be able to have outdoor experiences, who will be able to really understand the grandeur of Mother Earth. And so thank you for pulling off what seemed to be like an impossible effort to convince people to make that level of investment. We're going to miss the harmony of your voice and the harmony of your legislative skills, but we're not going to say permanently goodbye to you because we hope that you will be sending us messages just like the one you sent today and reminding us that we can do better. So thank you, Lamar, for your contribution in a lot of your life to these very important issues that affect so many of us. Thank you. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. I first met Lamar Alexander in 1995 when he spoke at Boston's Lincoln Day Dinner. Like today, he was folksy, good-humored, thoughtful, and impressive. I remarked to Ann that he was surely going to go places. Of course, he'd already gone places by then, but he ran for president the next year. One thing Lamar and I agree on is the best candidate for president does not always win. 